<laughs> so back uh, here in the uh, conference, uh, Mass Torts 2019, uh, joining me now is uh, Carissa Phelps. She is of counsel with Levin Papantonio. Uh, Carissa, welcome to the program. Thank you. Would, would you just, just step sure. in just a little bit here? Thank you. Yes, a lot of background noise. Yeah. <laughs> um, and just going to bring you down just a little bit. So, okay, you are working on on, tra- on human trafficking. Anti-human yes? trafficking, yes. Okay. Can you tell us about, are there plaintiffs, defendants? What, what, what? There are so many. I mean, there are so many people that we have not gotten in touch with yet to represent that need to know their rights. That's where we're at right now. And we know that we have clients that are signing up, that want to sign up, that as soon as they're educated just a bit about what their rights are, um, they're able to go forward and, and file some claims against hotels that knew, really knew, and should have known that they were harboring sex trafficking, that they were allowing it to happen. Um, other companies that were also helping to arrange it and profiting off of it through websites and other means. and financially, the people who are um, financially supporting, you know, child pornography, child sex trafficking, kind of same groups of individuals. And all of those people that make it possible and make it profitable for sex trafficking to happen, that's where, I mean, that's what we're going after. After 10 years of doing advocacy myself on the ground level and realizing we just can't rescue every single victim all the time and offer them all the services that they need, we have to stop making more victims. Okay. All right. So, um, so let me just go back here yeah. and we'll, we'll work through that. So the the main defendants are hotel chains or specific hotels? Yeah, I mean, you, you see brands like big brands that are out there and some of them run and operate and own their their places, their organizations. Some of them franchise them out and try to say they have no liability because they're franchised. But they're putting their brand on that and they're so doing a lot of So are we talking like, I mean, can you say wh- who the defendants are? Are they like w- sure. what brands? Yeah. Like, <laughs> t- no, I mean, well, Motel 6 is, right. a, is a big one and that's owned and, um, and much the, mo- mostly operated by G6 Hospitality, which uh, is owned by, uh, by a private equity firm, by a, in, a lot of, in, pretty much investments are made through pension funds. So when you track the money where it goes from, it's kind of interesting because it's a full circle of these investments, um, these investment managers are putting money into organizations where the people's retirement funds, who they're investing, yes, are actually either their children are being hurt at these motels, right, or law enforcement. They're going in trying to help and battle this problem, and they don't realize that it's their retirement dollars, their money, actually funding this activity mm-hmm. by being. They don't realize they're right. owners. They're owners of this as well, um, in terms of that. So. So okay. So let's take uh, Motel Six, but I mm-hmm. imagine there's other there's other chains, obviously, yeah. and um, we can get to the franchisee um, a question, and I wonder if the the what the uh, the uh, the bureau, the National La- Labor Relations Board their ruling in regards to uh, like McDonald's. Do, does that have any sway? Do you know what I'm talking about? The the relationship between uh, franchisees and franchisors, does that have implications in this at all? Or I mean, I think that you might have to show that somewhat they had some, some activity going on, but the issue with the motels, not unlike the fast food industry, is that a lot of the people work there for a very short time. Like these employees, the maid services, the, right. even the general managers, it's like, they're, they're there and they're gone. And so really, who holds liability in that case, right? Who's the responsible party? Is is the larger brand. It is. Okay. And so so how did they, uh, I mean, uh, tell, like, what is the theory here that they that they knew? That they that knew, they knew or should have or yeah, known. And, and maybe before you tell me uh, how, what they knew or should have what what was it that was taking place? I mean, what, like, specifically? Sure. So when traffickers use hotels, um, and I consider traffickers either buyers, actually the people that people call Johns, right, to try to humanize them, right. people who purchase sex that go in and rent rooms for the purpose of assaulting someone, and in the case of children, child sexual abuse, child sexual assault, uh, when they rent those rooms from the motels, they're giving them a financial benefit. So 
that part of it is where they have their liabilities. They're, they're, they're taking money from people that they know are about to use their room for this activity. And how and do, somebody is hurt, right? And how, yeah, and how do you establish that they know? That they knew or, or that they should have known. Because of the number of, um, well, sometimes it's the number of police calls, but oftentimes police stop responding. It's actually pretty sad. The worst that it gets at a motel location, the most rampant areas of sex trafficking, they'll stop responding and that mostly staff doesn't want them to respond sometimes because it takes a ding, the hotel will, or the motel will take a ding or get a fine or be at risk of being shut down or be at risk of being criminally held liable from the city attorney's office. So sometimes the calls are, are not made to law enforcement that should be and then sometimes they're ignored. Um, you have multiple reports that that come out of it, um, police investigations, trafficking cases where specific locations are named again and again. I see. So someone is either other guests at the hotel or you people you can go on TripAdvisor and pretty much put in prostitution or trafficking and other other types of crimes, and you'll see if a mo if a motel or hotel. So they are aware that this is all going on. Um, so it is at least primarily a function of the criminality that's been found there in the past. And that people are being hurt. I mean, we're right. not just talking about bags of drugs, which are are harmful. We know that, right? That if we were seeing a, a drug den going on, we would be appalled and we should be appalled. But we're talking about children being raped again and again, over and over, and there being information that, that gives knowledge, really. I mean, really gives some actual knowledge that this was happening and that they're ignored. They're, seen, they're, they're considered, the children that are out there, disposable by these companies and the companies have made profits and the children, if they live to be adults, if they get that opportunity to live to be adults, live with Im immense pain don't aren't able to trust right don't go on and and feel safe in the world right and then imagine seeing all these motel six or other branded motels and hotels and these these lies they tell about how safe they are and that they're family friendly and that they're a good you know good place to be and hearing that if you've been victimized there repeatedly um, now you you started in activism that was uh, a function of of having been yeah. a victim yourself. We, we, That's you personal. No, it's a very personal story because I tried to get totally away <laughs> from it. I went to school. I went to college. I was a math major. I was so far away from trying to think about my past. And when I went to law school, I, I was focused on business law. I wanted to figure out how to how to make make sure that capital is used in a in a way that really helps, right? Like we can we can use capital in a way that can promote social good, and so that was my focus. And when I came out of law school and business school with the JD MBA, I went in back to the streets where I had been kidnapped when I was 12 years old. I went back to the places, and it was still happening, almost two decades later, in the same places, rampantly. And pretty much all I could see being the solution at that point was a bulldozer. I mean, we need to just have these properties taken out of these communities and plan safe communities with as, as much destruction that has happened in these neighborhoods for as many years as it's gone on. You really need to invest in, in, in that much more, right? right? You have to really make it the, the best type of place. So I attempted to do that um, it, back in the areas where I had been trafficked, where it was still happening. Now, where was this? In, in Fresno. Fresno, California. Fresno, California. Yeah. And unfortunately, the whole crisis happened. The financial crisis happened. We weren't able to raise the money we needed to really buy. At that point, I just wanted to buy the properties and just take them down, right? Um, so we, I went into just community, neighborhood activism, raising awareness, because a lot of people didn't understand what the issue was. I had um, a county supervisor in Fresno County tell me that, every community needed a place where you could buy sex and drugs and to my face and and that was the attitude and that is the attitude in many communities that as long as it's kept over there and it's away from me right and we don't think about though what drives it and the profits that drive it and and that's what we're i mean we're really trying to think for um for the plaintiffs uh can you 
tell me a little bit more about your story? Or is sure. That, uh, no, I wrote a book about it, so okay, I'm, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm pretty open about it. And it motivates me. I think that's the important part is it motivates me to do what I do. Uh, I know that I got off the streets for a purpose, for a reason. And when I was there, I met people. I saw things I was a part of. I was, you know, myself, like I said, kidnapped, assaulted, so sold. You, you were kidnapped and... Um, it, 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 were you grow, were you living in Fresno at the time? So I was a I was considered an out of control youth at 12 years old, a runaway. I had some unaddressed traumas that had happened when I was 11 years old and younger, and because of that, and because of a lack of counseling and resources and education, where I lived in a small town called Colinga, um, the recommendation and advice that my That's mother in was giving, as well. yeah, Colinga, California. In Fresno County, the recommendation and advice my mother was given was to take me to juvenile hall and drop me off, which a lot of kids are, that happens to them. They go in, they go into the system then, they go into group homes, they get recycled through group homes, they, you know, and for chronic runners who are traumatized, they just end up back on the streets. Then somebody picks them up, says, and this is what happened in my story, right? I'll take care of you if you take care of me with full intention of keeping me at a motel and me being that person's sex life at 12 years old. And because it happened to me, I know how true it is, right? And even like when I, when I finally got out of it, when I got to be able to get my education, get back in school, I had missed seventh, eighth, and ninth grade. I went back to school, graduated high school, went to community college, went to college, and I thought to myself, I'm going to write checks to programs that help kids in another country that this happens to. I did not realize how rampant it was, even though it happened to me and I knew other girls that were out there. I didn't realize how rampant it was and how it had gotten not just not just the same, that it stayed the same, but it had gotten much worse. And is, is that, is your story, like, typically how it happens in this country, that it's kids who are falling through the cracks uh anyone could be a victim i mean we we say it's a definitely an equal opportunity destroyer it can reach anyone any household any age group um any gender as well and so i particularly was vulnerable and there'll be vulnerabilities that are preyed upon like being you know someone that some people are not looking for even though i was missing i was a runaway i was reported missing nobody was really looking for me i wasn't a milk carton kid right, right? um so that that leaves some vulnerability no one will know and it's how serial killers actually choose their victims a lot of times is if they are considered sex workers or prostitutes and they're not going to be looked for how did you uh get out of that situation so I had been taken from one person to another, which often happens. Like you could either be thinking that you're going to be getting something better. So I went with someone else who was saying he would get me out of it. He was more violent, hurt me more, held me, and was actually probably taking me to murder me when we were pulled over by a law enforcement officer who recognized me as a, I mean, he potentially saw me that I was out of place in this right. car. And unfortunately missed that there was another 15-year-old girl next to me. She did not get any help. Um, and I, my help was being arrested and taken to juvenile hall and spending 30 days in juvenile hall. And that was my escape from that trafficker. It didn't mean that trafficking was over, unfortunately. It continued. It continued until later in my life. And I was able to finally turn things around um, and go to, like I said, get back to school at 15 and start to see a better, a brighter future for myself. How do you, how do you, like, so you, you the, the, those 30 days was the beginning because then you became aware of what was going no, on? No, I'd say or? it got worse after that 30 days. Well, so then how did you get... So I ended up getting in more and more trouble, crimes, gangs, partly for protection too. Um, more sexual assaults, more trafficking happened because once somebody knows that you've been a victim, of prostitution or trafficking, then you become a target, actually more of a target for it um, again and again. So that happened. I was targeted. And then I, when I was in juvenile hall for the longest period was six months, and I met a counselor who he was a very positive influence in my life. He's still in my life today, who told me I had potential. He allowed me to write a journal. He got me counseling, therapy, like the whole mix of things that I needed. 
uh, encouraged me to have an inter a relationship with my mother and helped me to really heal in a way that didn't just immediately rescue me because that's right. not what happens, um, but it started. That was like a pivot point where it started that I had a new message I could play in my mind, which was you have potential instead of the other messages. So is the dynamic, is the dynamic for obviously you know it's not true for everybody but is the dynamic for um, for for kids who are in that situation that they it's not necessarily that they are physically kept from leaving that it, it's just that they don't see any other options it could be either to their life yeah it could be either I mean you could be have that physical you're trapped right I mean especially imagine as a child 12 years old you don't drive a vehicle you don't you can't get out if right. I go, you don't need, if you I don't go know out where you of are. this motel right. even if he opens the door and tells me to leave I'm thinking okay there's somebody worse waiting for me out there right you just don't know what, yes. yes so you have you have that element of being trapped um, which I think is a, is almost a physical barrier to getting out of it. And then you have the emotional and mental pieces of it that you don't trust people. Um, clients that, you know, were raped by police officers, assaulted by police officers who they thought were going to help them. And right. so that's not the, the majority of law enforcement that's out there. And I really, I work closely with law enforcement, so I don't want to paint that picture. But it happens, and it has happened. And so... Wow. And so what... Um I guess, so when you look at something like SESTA FOSTA, mm -hmm. um, which is a little bit off topic here, because I, I do want to go back to, you know, uh, how you're establishing claims against these, these uh, courts, but, but with SESTA FOSTA, from your perspective, like what, uh, what was your perspective on, on the, that legislation, which I should just tell people was, uh, it basically prevented um, uh, the advertising of 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 sex workers in magazines or online or websites, or websites. yeah so websites had kind of a free reign with the communication decency act oddly named cda 230 allowed websites and hosts of websites and designers of websites to not be liable for anything that people post on their website right and they interpreted that very broadly, the courts did, very, very broadly. So it was just basically immunity for the people who were making the money off of the activities that were happening, the most money off of it, um, they were immune. And so FOSTA-SESTA took that immunity away. And, and I think it really pissed people off. It has pissed people off, right? We, um, but my understanding is that, that some activists are like, this is problematic because this is one of the ways that we track and help. Um, I think that narrative's being uh, paid for, and um, really, yeah, I do. Um, I think so. One of the things that I'll talk about later today is Soros Foundation and Open Society um, Foundation that has put billions in dollars into planting a narrative um, that says that this these the websites and that and that sex trafficking itself is not sex trafficking that there there's sex work that we're they're empowering and there's opportunities to empower sex workers through um hold on one second i think uh -huh. we're having a little bit of problem with our connectivity um are we there guys okay all right i'm sorry um sorry about that didn't see um it's okay um so, to be clear, the, the, the Soros Foundation... Yeah, and the tech industry. I mean, we've pissed them off. We've taken away a huge treat that they've had for a very long time, right? Well, why would the Soros Foundation... I, 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 oh, okay. So, the Soros... So, there, um, there's this... There's a, a narrative that they want to push that people who have... People who have been arrested for being victims in sex work, do des they need a voice. I've been giving that voice. We have a voice. We're, we've been trying to give a voice to that. I Myself, I just said I was arrested as a 12-year-old victim. That shouldn't have happened. Right. And I've been working against that for a very long time. Um, what's happened is that tur that's turned into we shouldn't arrest the buyers. We should allow pimps or managers to be able to do their job of selling people. Um, and this full decriminalization argument has come out of the Soros Foundation. Um, they've been behind a lot of the other full decriminalization arguments in other crimes, like around marijuana and 
other other issues that they feel that that should not be criminal. Actually, some um, some of the people that are funded by him and some of the research that comes out says that property crimes, like if someone breaks into your home, shouldn't be a criminal well, act. But, so, but, so, wait, but but so just to be clear in yeah. terms of sex work. Um, which I don't think exists, sex work itself. But you don't think it... I mean, I think you need big quotes around sex work because the, the dynamic and the power differential of somebody who's offering money for that piece of you, that part of you, um, is, is unequal. It's just unequal. It's, it's unequal to an extent that doesn't make it a fair bargain at all for the person that's being purchased. Um, so I don't consider it work. Okay. I mean, I think that's the... That is you know, the perspective, um, I mean, I think there, there are people who, who uh, think sex work should be legalized and that right. having a regulatory structure will um, be the best way to protect um, people who are trafficked and who are, you know. Which creates more victims, actually, yeah. Um, okay, I mean, that's, yeah. all right, because I, I just want that out there because I'm the, uh, the perspective of some of the folks uh, yeah. who are against SESTA FOSTA feel that this is the only way to track what's going on for victims. How else would you find victims, or I guess this litigation is part of that, is like you know, we, we know, know where already they're where they're at, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's part of the problem. Yeah, is we know that, where they're at. I mean, do, we have, do, do you have a sense as you pursue this litigation, like um, how do you establish damages? Um, like where, do, how do you peg a figure on this? Um, and is the idea that you're trying to reach people essentially like yourself who have um, been victims and have, and are obviously not currently victims right now, but need to, to get out of this, this system before they basically say, we have a claim against the hotel companies that knew this was happening in their properties and just allowed it to continue. And took profits for it, yeah. Um, so it's kind of, it's been a long road. I started telling my own story in 2006, and at that time I was uncertain about what my beliefs were around sex work, around any of it. I really didn't know. All I knew that kids were was that kids as young as 11 years old were being arrested and charged with prostitution. Right. And I knew that was wrong. I knew that from my own experiences, and I knew that from going and sitting with the youth. Um, many of them were in foster care or group homes or probation. They were kids that didn't have parents except for the state. You know, we were their parents, and we weren't doing a good job. So uh, my advocacy has been around bringing awareness. Probably like the first five years of the advocacy work I've done has been bringing awareness for child victims of trafficking. For, you know, Pat, and, and part of my focus at that point was on Backpage early on. I mean, I was I was focused on the fact that this was happening. It was happening rampantly. I'd have young girls tell me, well, how could it be illegal? It's out there in the open. They really believed that. They didn't believe that, that it could be illegal. They thought they were partaking in something that was accepted, and it was being accepted at that point, largely, in society. So if we ignore something, it's like the broken window theory, right. kind of, right? If we ignore it, it gets worse. It gets much worse. So, and for them to start internalizing that, oh, because because it's open and out there, somehow it makes it okay that I'm a victim, um, means that they're going to be trapped in that for so much longer, much much longer. And so, um, once we've once we've seen services and programs now being built up because of the awareness and because. There's, there's some funding coming out for services, finally. Um, and then those services have to get mature and know how to deliver those services and learn and get evidence from what works and what doesn't work. Um, then you start to see and start to be able to measure. And those are those services who uh, are geared towards kids who are trafficked. So the, because I think the, I mean, at least I think my conception has largely been like, we're not, society's not aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like some type of rescue mission. You come in, you see the kids, you bring them out. It's the Hollywood and, version. And the end of the story. This is really more about um, kids who are in a system are not aware that they're being victimized yeah. until they get older. Yeah. Because they're yeah. 12 and they just... Right. And so um, when you talk about something like Backpage, do they look at Backpage and say like, oh... 
I'm being advertised. So it must be fine, or, or do they have a like? When it was, would a, would a victim at this point be aware of like SESTA FOSTA? Would just the idea of it um, helps prevent some of it? Yeah, it helps. Prevent. They they become aware like, yeah. oh, this is illegal. I'm yeah. a victim. Yes, yes, that's what it helps, and that's where it helps. But it was a huge. I mean, it was a huge ask to go to the tech industry or to 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 the web, you know, infrastructure of 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 internet companies that were profiting off of post and wanted to maintain zero liability and say, can you police yourselves, right? right? Can you go ahead and start doing the right thing? Can you can you not allow this to happen? It wasn't going to happen. And so it did take a huge, you know, and Meat wake cleaver. up call to say, no, it's not going to happen anymore. There's going to be liability. Um, and you see that that has pushed it to other places. It's still in the open. I believe that a lot of the trafficking still happens out in the open. You have websites like Seeking Arrangements and Sugar Daddy where it's happening and there'll be lots of disclaimers. Um, you have ways oh, there's that- there's presumably dating sites. Presumably dating sites. Um, there's, which I think are actually far worse than some of the other ones, but um, then there are places where it's just social media, right? It's just social media, but you know that this these traffickers target certain accounts and certain people and hit them up regularly, right? And are are basically fishing for victims. I mean, they get out there and they and they go on they go on and befriend people. Um, I had a young woman that she, as soon as she turned 18, was told, oh, come be in music videos in New York, come be a part of this, and na name drop some people they worked with, had some photos on the webs, on the, um, on the social media site that they were contacted through. And then before you know it, she's taken out, you know, out of state from across the country, from California to New York, and then told, you know, B, bitch, you're going to be mine, and you owe me money now for being here and for me getting you here. And that's how, I mean, these arrangements are set up. It doesn't have to be necessarily an open site. It's still happening out in the open. Right. How, um, what, the, are there syndicates of traffickers? That I work mean, together? Yeah. I mean, like, like, how is this organized? Is this a, like, is, is this a function of organized crime? Is there, is there a... So there are various there, types of, I mean, yes. Yes. So you can have everything from where the businesses, even the hotels or the hotel managers are involved. Um, you could have gangs that are involved and are profiting off of trafficking. That's happened multiple times, in multiple cases where gangs have worked together to traffic and have that as a source of funds. Um, you have even rival gangs that work together to traffic, to increase trafficking and in the, in the market of trafficking and increase funds. Um, so, so yes, I mean, and all right, so how will you establish uh, ultimately if you find those victims, that, like as you say, as services ramp up and organizations get in contact with uh, just have start to have some type of regular contact right. with victims, this is this litigation is an opportunity for those services to say like we can get you a, a settlement essentially that will allow you to go and leave, you know, provide you with the resources to be independent to restart your life. And there's a there's a hurdle when you're talking with organizations that provide services because they have a particular set of interests for the clients and litigation is not always easy, right? Um, one of the goals that we have is eliminating the statute of limitations. Right. Why should anyone ever think, oh, I can get away with this criminal activity that's hurting other people if I just if it, it just has to that be that they don't come forward for what this are many the, years? Uh, and I, I imagine they're state by state. Mm -hmm. What are the statute of limitations? On well, the federal like? one is the one I'm particularly thinking of is for the Traffic Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, the TVPRA. Um, right now it's 10 years. So that'll be something I'm going to be looking at. And I've been talking to people who are going to propose some new changes to that, where at least let's not start that 10 years until someone realizes that right. they've been a victim. Because to put somebody through that while they're in the middle of going through seeking services, getting help, is really difficult. I mean, that's going to be some of our clients. Some of them are still minors. Some of them, you know, parents are outraged, like with the back page cases. I mean, parents were outraged and went and sought counsel um, because of that. So we'll hear from parents. We'll hear directly from the youth. I mean, 
um, not unlike not unlike the opioids. I mean, we should be hearing from the counties. The counties should be saying, hey, you know, we know that these companies are profiting off of this and that it's our kids that are in our care. They're in foster care, right? They're in our care and we have to absorb all those costs of getting them help and services, which may never happen for them, right? And so, um, so we may hear from them as well. Uh, but it's, it is difficult for that initial connection to happen, to say, I, I'm valuable. Right. I have rights, or my daughter who was murdered at a motel, right? I want to fight for her. I want to bring up that memory again. I mean, that's difficult to ask people to do, and we want to be there for them during that whole process. So where and what what uh, where is it in the process at this point? Like, are you, um, you've identified defendants, I guess, presumably. Yeah. Uh, you are looking for plaintiffs and yeah and do you have a timeline i, I kind of like have what? two strategies myself okay so we have the big brands that are out there that we're going to probably get the the mass torts going i mean that's that is our goal is, is we're here at mass torts conference i mean it's pretty obvious that's what we we want to see a large number of victims recover and that's only going to happen through this type of litigation. And I'm really excited about it. I'm excited about learning about mass torts and that that's an opportunity right. to go forward in that direction. Because that's how it needs, that's how things are going to change, is through that. Um, now, then you have the small motel operators throughout, like throughout California, will have hundreds that this is their main source of revenue is from and being involved in this. So I've got to think about that strategy a little bit different because now we're not talking about a corporate brand, but we're talking about adding up all these places where they've been harboring sex trafficking for decades and getting away with it. Um, some of them not under a brand, right? Right. So, um, so those, there's kind of two avenues in the, in the hotel, motel industries that I'm thinking about. Um, mass torts and then individual claims that, that victims can have and maybe we have dozens of victims against one or dozens of, right. of defendants in those small motels. To what extent is there uh, a pursuit of legislation that would be the functional equivalent of SESTA-FOSTA but for other entities that are profiting off of this? So, um, Like why isn't there a federal statute that says if your motel has been the site of three, I don't know, three criminal activities over the course of five years, or you know, was some it's a great argument for that. I mean, you probably know, like we we know that hotels and motels have this um, increase. They have basically a, a higher duty of care for their right. for the people who are coming onto their property who they're renting rooms to. So how in the world could you know that your hotel is rampant with crime, with kidnappers, with people who potentially are rapists, murderers, you know? How could you know that and keep that door open? Really? Right. I mean, it should, and, and the industry standard isn't there yet in terms of policing themselves is not there yet. They're starting to do education around human trafficking, but we've seen for the last decade things so when, be on the books and they are not doing things differently. When motels uh, use, when, when, when traffickers use motels, are they like, are the kids there for like, you know, 24 seven and people are coming in to buy their yeah, services? Yeah, so one of the things uh, that you might see is that they'd be repeat, there'd be a number of people throughout the day who are unrelated coming in to that same room to okay. sexually I mean, so, assault I mean, so or rape I mean, it's that like person. If, if the motel was even vaguely vigilant about it, they could, it's fairly easy to identify what's going on. And the on. sad thing that I've heard is, one. this is one of the smaller motels, but they had cameras on every door. They could see every door every door and the children thought that was to trap them to hold them there they didn't see the cameras because the cameras would see the people coming in and out all the time right so and they didn't do anything about that so the kids assumed they were being watched oh my god and that they weren't allowed to go in and out what um what, what was your reaction around the whole jeffrey epstein thing i mean what i mean what, like what was your sense as someone who obviously now 10, 15 years working on the side of trying to help victims, having been a victim, like what, do you have a sense of that scenario? I just hope it doesn't, I hope we, we don't ignore it just because he's, he's dead. I mean, it, he's, he, what he has done will have an impact 
forever. I mean, re really, it, it has an impact on the lives of the people that he harmed. Right. Generationally, it goes through generations after that. Um, the number of people that that participated with him that haven't been held accountable yet uh, for the harms that they've done to those same children that he hurt, that he trafficked, um, is appalling. And like, just the the amount of time that went un. Um, Unaddressed. Unaddressed. I mean, we knew what happened. He went to prison but got released on a program where he was out every day right. victimizing people while he was in prison. The fact that we in, we condoned that for so long, needs to we need to look at ourselves as a society and say, what else are we missing? Right. right? What else are we missing? And it should be an indication and a measure of us, how kids are treated. Um, should be an indication of how how we are doing as a society, and we did bad in that case. And there, there we're not the only ones, you know, in the world that that are not doing well in this. And there's no magic wand to get rid of it, but we have to address every case vigilantly, and not just slap people on the wrist for buying, for procuring, for offering, for selling, and and that includes every level that profits off of this. Uh, uh, Chris Phelps um, of Council with Levin Papantonio. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Where can people go? Uh, do, uh, uh, are there websites that you recommend or, or organizations that you recommend for people to get more information yeah, about this? Yeah, if somebody needs resources or services, the Human Trafficking Hotline, which is 888-3737-888. That's how I memorize it. 888-3737-888. And that is, that is the line to call, no matter if you're in need of services or if you're a service provider and you want to let people know that you're out there providing services and you want to be vetted and be on that line, then call them and get on that line. Um, there's also a text way that, that people who can't call can reach them by text, and that's be free, which is 233733. Um, that could be text, and you could text info or help to that line. And on on the website, National Human Trafficking Resource, uh, nhtrc.org, you can look up state by state what's available in your community and your area. So that's the primary one that I would send people to. And is there a is there any type of uh, activists who are pursuing legislation uh, along this? Or? Yeah, and they have a whole policy page for it. So again, if you oh, want okay, to get involved place. locally, you can see where your state is, what they're doing, how they're how they're ranked is on Shared Hope International um, website, but, but Polaris has a start to all of that information, and Polaris is the National Human Trafficking Resource Center. We'll have all that information. All right, Chris Phelps, thank you so thank much for your you. time today. I really Thanks, appreciate Sam. it. All right, folks, we're going to have...